what says the New Testament of the fulfillment of the ancient prophecies of Israel? What says Jesus Christ concerning himself and the work he came to do? Our Lord Jesus Christ made it plain that what the apostles had seen and understood, what was made plain to them in the Gospel, was in fact the expectation of the true Israel, Israel within Israel, represented by the prophets and righteous men from of old, who prophesied and spoke of his kingdom and longed to see it for themselves, but died before the time. This which was being revealed was the messianic kingdom for which the world had waited 4,000 years since mankind was cast out from the presence of God. What the righteous men of old time longed to see was the coming of the promised seed of the woman, who, by his cross and passion, bruised the serpent's head and overcame death and sin in the grave. The kingdom of Jesus Christ, the messianic deliverance, was not to be a Jewish restoration to privilege and to Palestine, for there is not a mention of this in Christ's discourse here or anywhere else. The promised kingdom was to come by the preaching of the gospel. Moreover, the right of entrance was not by a Jewish birth certificate, but by individual repentance and faith. Nothing is more fascinating in the pursuit of Bible knowledge than the discoveries made in the four Gospels of the Savior's testimony to himself in terms of the writing of the Old Testament prophets. At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on a Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions, how he entered the house of God, and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat nor for those with him, but for the priests alone? Or have you not read in the law, that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion, and not a sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, Matthew 12, 1-8 The Lord of the Sabbath approves, for he is the bread of life. And what better day than the Sabbath to feed upon him who takes the symbol of the corn to prefigure his own redemptive sacrifice and the far-spreading cornfields to symbolize the harvest of the souls of men. Here is one greater than the temple and greater than David, in whom all become kings and priests who are redeemed by his blood. The kingdom of grace was coming in fast, and there would be some mighty scene shifting as all Israel's earthly administration passes into the inward and spiritual reality which the externalism of the law only prefigures. See how the Savior was all the time preparing to abolish the outward signs to make way for the things signified thereby. And a man was there whose hand was withered. And they questioned Jesus, us King, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. And he said to them, what man is there among you who has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored to normal, like the other. 
Matthew 12, 10 to 13. The human hand is the greatest instrument on earth. A withered hand is the symbol of man's lost dignity and inheritance. The Israel synagogue could do nothing for that man. The withered hand is here the token of Israel's impotence under the law. On the other hand, the healing of that man shows the nature of Messiah's kingdom. Its subject are those who are restored to the true dignity and function for which God created men, that he should be the regent of God in creation, as it were, God's right hand. Then a demon possessed man who was blind, and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him, so that the mute man spoke and saw. Matthew 12 22 The devil is cast out and the man sees and speaks. Just another work of healing and mercy? Not at all. This man, like the one with the withered hand, is a picture of the state of the Jewish people, and he is a part of the prophecy just quoted by Matthew and claimed by our God the Lord in Isaiah 42, 6-7. I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness, I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you and I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. That is the description of the onset of the course of Christ's reign. There is no end of earthly glory and exaltation for the Jewish nation. The kingdom exists in the opening of blind eyes and the deliverance of captives from prison and from darkness. The deaf and dumb man is Israel. His presence before Christ is a dramatization of the prophecy. It is a call to the unconverted. No Jew will ever be saved or exalted except on the precise terms of individual conversion available equally to Gentiles. The times are changed. The former things are come to pass. The Old Testament order has run its course. God is declaring new things. The new covenant kingdom of grace is announced. See verses 6 and 7. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise from the end of the earth. Isaiah 42, 10. It is the new song of eternal salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ as described by the Apostle John in Revelation 5, 8, 9. And the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. Jesus Christ had made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. See Revelation 5, 9, 10. Isaiah's prophecies on the Messiah rolls along, describing the long-anticipated kingdom of Christ, composed of Jew and Gentile, and having no center, but in heaven and no ruler, but the one who reigns in the invisibility of the deity. Israel, as the servant of the Lord, should have guided the nations to the true God. They boasted and still do, that as a people they are the only agency by which God reveals himself to the world. They should have been the people who, seeing, should give sight to the blind Gentiles. Hearing the word of God, they should have opened the ears of the deaf heathen. Instead of fulfilling their divine function, they were blind, deaf and dumb themselves, 
therefore the kingdom would be taken from them. Worse, their sickness was sinister. It was the fruit of a satanic activity, for their representative man was possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. From the day of Jesus Christ onward the nation of Israel devoid of light and truth, a people from whom the Spirit of God has departed, never to return. This does not, of course, mean that individual Jews may not have hope. Jews are converted in considerable numbers. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Matthew 12:34. Our Lord God concludes his railing against Israel with an ominous warning, in Matthew 12, 42-45. Now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. These words can only be understood in terms of Israel's fate. The expulsion of the first demon denotes the temporary break which Israel received when the gospel was being preached for 40 years after Pentecost, to the Jews first. The return of the demon denotes how the unbelief and final impenitence of the nation presents the powers of darkness with ready and prepared access. The seven devils more wicked than the first show the complete extent to which the nation after its probation gave itself up to final impenitence with the appalling consequences of greatly magnified unbelief and irremediable darkness and blindness. The last state of Israel is a nation, a people blind and dumb, without guidance or hope, is worse now than ever before in history, because most of the nation is openly atheistic, or at best sceptical, and without any assurance of immortality. Their rejection by the Lord is complete. Matthew 12 closes on a solemn note. The Virgin Mother and the brothers of the Lord stand outside the house. They wish to speak with him. A messenger intimates to the Lord their desire. But he answers, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? He waves his hand toward his disciples and says, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother, and sister, and mother. He no longer stands in blood relationship with the nation of Israel. Even the Virgin Mother must stand aside, because she has fulfilled her task in bringing the first begotten into the world. Henceforth she stands towards him not as mother, but as creature in the presence of her Creator. She stands also for the true and spiritual Israel, which can be related to him only insofar as its children do the will of God in believing on him whom the Father has sent. There could not be clearer or more conclusive and solemn asseveration that Israel's special relationship with God sadly enough had come to an end. Behold Jerusalem. Behold the city of God, the Mount Zion to which believers have already come, 
though they may never see the earthly city in Palestine. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Hebrews 12 22a